So good morning and good evening to all. Uh, so Wildlife SOS, we are here to celebrate World Sloth Bear Day. And this is the second World Sloth Bear Day we are celebrating. The um, uh, inauguration was uh, last year in 2022. And we have many people, uh, two um, eminent speakers today. Uh, before going to the experts, I will briefly take two minutes to share Wildlife SOS work with you all. Wildlife SOS started working on sloth bear since 1998. And uh, the main area of focus was to rescue and rehabilitate these dancing bears across India. So the founders um, submitted a report and the government gave us an opportunity to work with the forest department and to collaborate with them to reduce or completely stop this practice. So uh, my area of work, I started working on these bears since 2005. And my focus was on going to Chief Isla Warden, meeting them, discussing, brainstorming with the calendars and rescuing or surrendering these bears to forest department and bringing to our centers. Today, we have four sloth bear centers in India, uh, in Agra, Bhopal, uh, Bangalore and West Bengal. So um, coming to today's topic, we have two um, um, eminent speakers. Um, we have Dr. Satya Kumar uh, from Wildlife Institute of India, a scientist G and register. Uh, Dr. Satya Kumar has a master's and a PhD in wildlife science and has been working for wildlife conservation and sustainable development, largely in the mountain ecosystem since 1989. His research interests include species habitat, relationships in relation to human use, wildlife stock interaction, impact of human use and climate change on wildlife and their habitat, impact assessment of development projects, management of human wildlife conflict through community participation and use of modern tools and techniques. He has developed and implemented training programs to build skills of state forest departments and other stakeholders in the field of wildlife monitoring, habitat management, and management of human wildlife conflicts. His current research projects focus on impact on climate change on wildlife and their habitat in Himalaya under National Mission for Sustaining the Himalayan Ecosystem. Ecology of mountain ungulates, bears, galliforms, and human wildlife conflict. He has published over 100 research papers in peer-reviewed national and international journals. He is a member of IUCN, SSE, Bears, Bear, Caprina, Galliforms, and World Commission on Protected Areas. He is recipient of many awards, including Indian National Science Academy Award, Teacher Award, Citation Plaque by Resource Himalayan Foundation, Nepal for significant contribution towards conservation of Himalayan biodiversity. Sir, we are honored to have you on this occasion and we'll be hearing more from you as an expert in this area. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Baju. Um, can you please confirm that you can uh, hear my voice and also um, see the screen? Yes, sir. I can. Uh, we can very well hear your voice and screen. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, wishing you all on the World Sloth Bear Day. Um, I understand that people with the interest, a common interest of protecting sloth bears are here. Uh, I am going to uh, make a very short presentation about sloth bears, an animal that is very interesting to many of us, and uh, in fact, is very well connected with the people, the culture, and the lives of the uh, millions of people living in the Indian subcontinent. As many of you are aware, India is home to four species of bears. And the one you see in the bottom is the sloth bear that occurs up to Mount Abu in Rajasthan and most of central, slightly southeastern and then southern part of India and also western India. Then we have the uh, sun bear only confined to the northeast India and the Himalayan black bear or the Asiatic black bear all along the Himalaya um, from 1,000 meters up to tree line in Western Himalaya and from 70 meters up to tree line in the Eastern Himalaya. And further up, above the tree line in the Western Himalaya and in the Trans Himalaya, we have the Himalayan brown bear. 
So all the four bears, although they belong to order carnivora, they're largely omnivorous. And they have a very important ecological role to play, that is seed predation, seed dispersal. And uh, they are uh, very intelligent animals. They have excellent memory and uh, they track food all times. And that is one reason why they are in conflicts. With the exception of sun bear, the other three bears in India are in conflicts with people. So for uh, people who are new to and about the species, here are some background. Um, the sloth bear is a bear-like sloth uh, because of the appearance. It's a very shaggy mane and body. It's a medium-sized. It's a, uh, got a V-shape marked on its chest. Males way larger than the females. It's mostly a tropical or a subtropical animal, but it's very well adapted to specialized diet and survival in the hot uh, climatic zones of the Indian subcontinent. Talking about the cultural reference, yes, sloth bears can be traced back to ancient times. It is in folklore. It's all in um, tales that, that have been told to uh, children generation after generation. In the Indian mythology, the Jampawan, the Lord of All Bears, is believed to be the sloth bear because, and it's also uh, one of the uh, uh, very wise characters depicted in both the two major epics of India, Ramayana and the Mahabharata. If you see the distribution of sloth bear, it's uh, very the Western Guards, some bit of Eastern Guards, and then the central, eastern, and southeastern parts of India. Some hot, arid areas in the western parts of India that uh, that's close to the deserts of Rajasthan. Then you find them all along the foothills of the Himalaya and in some parts of northeast India. So we say, we estimate the potential sloth bear range in India to be around. Uh, 200,000 to 400,000 square kilometers. It's widely distributed and in the past is supposed to have been believed very widely distributed. But over time, their populations and distribution are kind of restricted to certain forested areas only. Uh, it is in the Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. The population trend, according to the IUCN, is declining. And uh, it is endemic only to the Indian subcontinent. As I mentioned earlier, it's found in India, Nepal, Bhutan and Sri Lanka only, although the subspecies uh, vary in Sri Lanka. As I said, this, these animals are uh, very well adapted to be in tropical areas where they have a low basal metabolic rate, high thermal conductance, and uh, so the, that helps them to reduce heat production and facilitate heat loss because they live in most of the dry and moist uh, hot areas of central India. They lack underfur, but their shaggy coat helps them to defend from insect bites. They are largely nocturnal. In some areas, they be, be, be crepuscular and uh, diurnal also, but largely they are nocturnal. They have certain adaptations, both morphological and behavioral. That's and they are uh, that's also driven by the seasonal availability of food resources. They feed largely on fruits, but year-round on termites, ants, and other insects. They have well-developed claws that are long and curved and help them in digging termite mounds and also underground for uh, insects. They live in a wide variety of habitats, as I just mentioned, uh, even in uh, semi-arid areas to uh, uh, some mountain evergreen alluvial grasslands to dry lowland forests in Sri Lanka. But much of the densities and distribution are confined to the moist and dry deciduous forest, which are largely in the peninsular and central India because of the greater fruit availability and also the insects availability. They also occur in very open areas where they have enough denning opportunity, cliffs and caves and talus and uh, even bushes of lantana, rocky outcrops, etc. But it could be surrounded by agricultural landscape. They lived there all day in the dens and uh, raid agricultural fields around in the night time. They uh, tend to avoid humans at all times, but would definitely like to come and uh, feed on the crops that are grown by humans. They have, their home ranges vary. Some are as small as four to eight square kilometers, but there are animals that have uh, also having larger home ranges. Males, as like many other animals also, have larger home, la uh, home ranges than females, but they overlap very much. Um, 
they appear to be uh, they are territorial and they also tolerate conspecifics. This animal is very well known for the unique parental care because the mothers carry cubs on their back uh, to avoid uh, any predation by other large predators along with they coexist like tigers and leopards. There are many interesting uh, videos that one might have seen about how mother uh, bears, stock bears defend uh, their cubs from tigers and leopards. As I said, although it's a carnivore, it's an omnivore, but the diet comprises mostly of fruits. And throughout the spring and summer monsoon seasons of India, uh, the forest across the country uh, where they live have large variety of fruits uh, like uh, uh, that are listed here, you can see. And um, there are, they also feed on cultivated crops and uh, yeah, raid orchards. And uh, throughout the year, they feed on uh, insects, uh, termite, and that they get, and also fallen fruits, flowers, etc. They occasionally do some uh, 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 breaking into, uh, like say, for honeycomb, be, uh, breaking into bee boxes uh, or uh, apiculture areas. Now, if you look at the threats for the bear, as just now, um, Bajiraj mentioned, in, in, in the past, we had uh, the threat of these dancing bears, which based on the efforts of uh, wildlife SOS, that has been completely eradicated in this region, I would say, that we no longer see bears. That's, uh, that's one threat that has been kind of taken care of. The other one is for poaching for gallbladder, which still continues. And uh, we need to be very careful about looking after. But Leaving aside these two, the other threats are the habitat degradation, habitat loss, fragmentation, land use, land cover changes around sloth bear habitats, increasing human use of bear habitats. And so the encounters of humans with sloth bears have kind of increased. And we hear a lot of news about conflicts from, say, Gujarat to central India to Odisha, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and so on and even also in Sri Lanka. So this is because uh, humans are using bear habitats uh, to a larger extent, and uh, bears are also raiding crops. So it is like growing human population, growing human use in this area. India is also fast developing. So developmental projects, infrastructure, uh, and so on, all, all have their own impacts. So one thing about resource sharing is that the the resources that are in the forest are also uh, are used by the people. So, for example, these mauva flowers and fruits people collect, and uh, this bears also like them very much. So, there's definitely encounters of people collecting mauva flowers or fruits in the season, and they get attacked by sloth bears. And in retaliation, many sloth bears are also killed by people. So, you know, I have always wondered why people can't go in groups and collect while two or three people can stand guard of the people who are collecting, but it generally doesn't happen. People like to go up and collect as much as they can because this is all a, a part of their livelihood. If you look at the uh, crop depredation and attacks on humans, you'll find a lot of data uh, from Central India to Western India to Southern India, and there are some states where sloth bear conflicts are really very high. I'm not going to go into the details, but all I can say is that yes, uh, bear attacks on humans have increased in the recent years. Also, retaliatory killings are also increased and loss, crop loss to farmers are also increasing. And the compensation that the government of India and the state governments pay is also phenomenal. The causes, largely, as I just mentioned, increasing use of an activity of people in bear habitats and uh, the areas where village and forest are um, interspersed, uh, humans using those areas in the for uh, uh, lack of toilets in their villages is one reason. But in the recent past, the government has tried uh, on a war footing to make sure that there are toilets in every villages, but the, uh, the, there's still uh, social change is required for all of them to use those. But ultimately, the basic fundamental problem is the space and resource use and the overlap between humans and bears. As I just mentioned, the uh, other attractants also in the area that can attract bears to the uh, human uh, areas and cause conflicts. One of our recent studies uh, on sloth bears by our uh, 
uh, institute where my colleague Dr. Vishnu Priya has looked at a uh, sloth bear um, uh, population genetic structure in all the tiger range areas in 17 states of India, which more or less is overlapping with the sloth bear range in India. There is only some area which does not have tiger, so that area I would like the westernmost part if you leave. And then you can see that uh, the studies indicate that the we may have a population of about 15 to 20,000. That's just an estimate by experts. But uh, the analysis shows that uh, there has been decline in the last 500 years uh, and also between 10,000 to 15,000 years ago. Uh, based on uh, genetic analysis, decline signals were recorded in all the landscapes. But in the Terai landscape, that is the foothills of the Himalaya, it has been very severe, as you see in this uh, uh, area. These are the uh, structure outputs. This is Western Ghats and Central India. And in very interesting news is that, yes, in the Central India and Eastern Ghats uh, are turning out to be the region of evolution of sloth bears in India. And they have the most diverse genetic uh, diversity in the area. And uh, whereas Terai region has gone through so much of uh, population declines that... Uh, we, they have come up again and they will be facing more problems in the future also. But otherwise, we have good intact genetic diversity population here. So the way ahead, I would like to summarize that, yes, uh, we need to prioritize areas for understanding high suitable areas for sloth bears, estimate their population and monitor them. We also need to restore some of the degraded sloth bear habitats and uh, also look at uh, suitable areas inside and outside protected areas. And wherever hotspots of human sloth bear conflicts are there, I think we need to do use remote sensing and GIS tools to keep these uh, risk maps prepared, dynamic, and inform the field managers regarding how to monitor hotspots. And without the support of local communities, we cannot protect the species. So we have to continue our awareness with the, with the local communities who are going to live in and near the sloth bear habitats. And uh, also, this, there is still a lot of knowledge gaps about the species, which I think further scientific investigations are required. And uh, with this, I stop my uh, short um, talk on the sloth bears and hand it over back to Bajuraj. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was uh, very quick and on time. <laughs> that stopped on uh, perfect time. Um, uh, it is so vast, vast experience and vast knowledge, but you had put it in very crisp uh, method. So we will, we will definitely dig out all these things and read uh, properly. And if somebody have more questions, we can go. So now I'll go to Thomas Sharp, uh, who is our next speaker. So Thomas Sharp is the Director of Conservation and Research for Wildlife SOS. Uh, he has been professional wildlife ecologist for more than now 25 years, working on many species like snakes on island of Guam to golden eagles in Western United States. He also presently serves IUCN Bear Specialist Group and also the co-chair of Sloth Bear Expert Team. Recently, he has been involved in large-scale ecological study of sloth bears in the wild using radio collars as a part of Wildlife SOS effort to ensure a sustainable future for these animals in the wild. So we have a lot of studies going on in Karnataka. So he has been um, mainly involved in these studies. I welcome um, Thomas Sharp uh, to share his experience and uh, um, about sloth bear with us and his studies. Thank you. Thank you, Baiju. Um, can I just making sure if you can hear my voice and see my slides. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so as Baiju mentioned today, I'm going to just speak a little about the Wildlife SOS Soft Bear GPS radio collar study in Daroji and Gutakote Soft Bear Sanctuaries in Karnataka, India. Okay. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, Daroji and Gutakote are in the state of Karnataka, a southern state in India, 
And you can see they're the second and third to the top there. That's generally the location that we are talking about. And the habitat in this area is very unusual. It's, it's by the Deccan Plateau in India, and it's a very rocky scrub jungle type of habitat. There's a lot of naturally occurring caves. In certain places, there are rivers running through it. And a key point here is although it might not look like great bear habitat, this is incredible bear habitat. There's a lot of food for the bears in, in the shape of termites and fruits and seeds. And the, the naturally occurring caves they use for denning. So it's really excellent habitat. And once you go into the habitat itself and get into it, the canopy is actually can be well above your head. And there are all these little spaces. It's not just good habitat for bears, but there's a host of wildlife species that live in this habitat. The other thing that you should be aware of when it comes to this habitat is that basically you have these rocky outcrops that were never farmed. So basically you have these little protected areas in basically a sea of agriculture. And these areas were probably initially saved because they couldn't be farmed. And then over time, they were given certain levels of protection. This is just another shot from one protected area looking out across the landscape. And you can see a reservoir and then more little protected areas in the distance. And this is the type of habitat that the bears are living in. Now, Wildlife SOS has been working in this part of the country for over a decade now. And we've been publishing different papers on sloth bears in this location, such as papers on denning and attacks, like Dr. Dr. Sathya Kumar talked about the attacks. We've worked on that down there, and even anthropogenic risks. And these would include things like snares that are a danger to bear, open wells, roads, these types of things. And I mentioned the denning, and just to bring this up again, soft bears, again, as you saw in the first presentation, these bears are basically crep crepuscular, or they like the mornings and evenings or the nighttime. So during the middle of the day, they like to rest in dens. And on the Deccan Plateau, where there's a bunch of naturally occurring caves, that's what the bears use exclusively. So here you have a camera trap shot of a bear emerging in the evening to go out and do its foraging, and then it will return to the den in the morning. And this is also how we found maternal dens. And how we did that was to put camera traps near the entrances of dens. And then you could see a mother coming back with her cub. And this is how we determined where the maternal dens were and we could keep an eye on these bears. This was actually the first time that we had put the camera trap up here. So the mom obviously wanted to make sure it was safe and not a problem. And after this, uh, luckily she didn't destroy the camera and she was pretty much used to it after that. So although we've been working in this area for over a decade, there are still little gaps in what we know about the sloth bears in this area. And we really wanted to get at these questions. What do they use or how do they use the landscape in an hourly fashion? How are they using the habitats? what kind of home ranges, how much they're overlapping with other bears, and even long distance dispersal. These were all questions we kind of still wanted answers for. And of course we want these answers so we can understand what, what the needs are of the bear so enough habitat can be conserved for these bears. And it's also important to understand that many of the studies, not all, but many of the studies on sloth bears have occurred in national parks or areas with a lot of protection. But it's roughly estimated that roughly two thirds of the bears that are around are not in fully protected areas. So we need to understand the ecology of these bears in semi-protected areas or areas that aren't protected at all. How much space is needed in these areas and where do they spend their time? How do they spend it? So to get at this, we wanted to collar some bears. Now there are, just quickly in review, there are two types of collars, GPS and VHF. Now the collars we're using are have capability of both. They're both GPS and VHF collars. But the VHF collars are an older technology, basically use radio, radio signals, and you can 
go into the field after a bear is collared and triangulate to discover the location of the animal and get data that way. It's very labor intensive to go out and get a point. And the newer technology, the GPS basically uses satellites and it can give you regular point location. So you can set it to get a point on a bear every two hours. And then as long as the bear is wearing that collar, you can get a point every two hours and you can simply download that data to your laptop, which is very convenient. But of course, in either case, you need to collar the bear and that's uh, that needs to be done by trapping the bear. So usually this is done using barrel traps this is a barrel trap we put in the forest where we knew we had bears. And what you do is you put the, the trap out for a while so the bears get used to it. Because when it's a new item in the forest, they'll somewhat stay away from it. But you can leave it out there for quite a while and the bears get quite used to it. You can even bait it and the bears will go in and out of the trap and you don't have to trap them. And you don't trap the bear until your team is fully ready and you can collar them quickly with as little problem as possible. So this is Dr. Arun, our lead, one of our lead vets at Wildlife SOS, and one of our lead wildlife ecologists, collaring the bear after it's been trapped and drugged. And he's fitting the collar onto the bear. And also I'd like to mention in the dark blue shirt there is Swami. Swami is one of our senior wildlife ecologists in our lead field ecologists. These guys are really experts at putting collars on bears and doing this type of work. And here you see the collar being fitted onto the bear. It's very important to get a proper fit. Uh, you don't want it too loose so that the bear can get out of the collar, but um, or that they can get a paw, say, trapped in it trying to remove the collar. But of course, you also don't want it too tight because you want the animal to be comfortable moving around in its normal way. I should also mention here that these collars can be removed um, remotely. We can literally hit keys on our keys on our computer to release these if there's a problem. But here you see Swami is clipping some of the fur. They have a lot of fur around the neck and they get the proper fit. They did a little fur trimming. And then once the collar is on and the bear is allowed to recover, you release it back exactly where you found it. And hopefully you can see this video. Here she is being released back into the wild. She seemed a little hesitant at first. But you can see she looks fine and wanders back into the jungle. And we also like to put camera traps into the field so that we can see the bear after it's been collared and make sure everything is okay. The collar looks good, the bear looks comfortable. And in this case, you can see she looks like a normal happy bear foraging during the night when they're most active. And of course, then you can also start downloading your points. Now this, I have um, two bears here. Bindu is in the green, Sindhu is the orange. So these are two different bears that were trapped in the same location, two female bears. And you can start to see this is, we plotted them on Google Earth here, just as an example, but you can somewhat even see on this, on this picture where the natural habitat and where the agricultural fields are. And you can start to get an idea that they're using the natural habitat, but they are certainly also going into the agricultural areas and maybe even more than we had anticipated originally. And if we back out a little further, you can see that these two bears overlap quite a bit, but yet they're a little offset so that you have Bindu a little further to the east and Sindhu a little further to the west. So they're kind of offsetting, although yes, there still is a lot of overlap with these two individuals. So just some very preliminary findings. A lot of these things we already knew and Dr. Sethia Kumar went through these in his talk. Um, of course, they are very active at night. This is probably the most nocturnal of of all the bear species. And they are crop rating. And they're crop rating in our area, at least, a little more than we had thought. Now, we've also found that at certain times of the year, they will actually travel quite a distance to go to specific food orchards, fruit fruit orchards, and feed on those, 
which is interesting. And we were also luckily able to document a long distance dispersal. And we were also able to get some preliminary uh, home ranges in Gutacote. Now these are very preliminary. They're only based on one baron. We don't have the full data set. So we don't wanna be, just to be clear, these are very preliminary. But one male bear, Bima, was using an area of roughly 71.9 square kilometers, while Bindu, a female, was using an area of about half that at 34.5 square kilometers. And how that fits into what we know in other places, Royal Chitwan National Park in Nepal, they had much smaller home ranges than this, ranging for the males up to 21. So you can see ours is they have quite a bit bigger home range. In Sri Lanka, as again, Dr. Sathya Kumar mentioned in his talk, this is a subspecies and they're a slightly smaller bear. They seem to have very small home ranges. But what we've got in our area is somewhat comparable to what was found in Pana National Park in India. Those were from 12 to 85. So we fall in that range. And as we move forward with the study, we'll be able to get more details on that. And finally, I'd like to end with talking just quickly a little about the long-term dispersal. It was actually Bindu, the bear that was in green. At one point, she just started heading south, a little east and very south. And she just took off from the area. We weren't sure where she was going. And so she somewhat hit the road. She's a three to four year old female. And she traversed over a hundred miles or 162 kilometers between the two areas. And she really beelined it down there. She took 11 days to get between these areas, between Gutakote and Gangapale Forest in the neighboring state of Andhra Pradesh. Now, interestingly, her sister or Sindhu, the Baron Orange, has stayed where she was. So, of course, one of the questions is why did she move? This could be resource related, potentially. We don't know for sure. It could be that Gutakote is a healthy population of bears and she was looking for more resources, but it's something we wanna look at in more detail. And the the route that she took to get to Gangapali, um, we don't know if that's a regularly traveled route or not. It's obviously something we'll keep our eyes on. And of course this dispersal is, is hugely important for conservation and it's a huge problem for large carnivores. Uh, connectivity between populations is very important for gene flow. You want genes to be flowing back and forth between these different populations. But dispersal is also important for colonization of new areas or potentially recolonization of areas that may have lost a certain species, as well as potentially simply range shifts by the animal. Now, just recently, in in 2022, a paper came out on a long distance dispersal by a male subadult tiger across fragmented habitat, which is an excellent paper. And we've been looking at quite a bit to kind of compare um, how the tiger traveled compared to how our bear traveled. Now, this was a subadult male tiger that moved between two wildlife sanctuaries and it moved over double um, the, air, um, the length that our bear moved but took 225 days to do it. Our bear, a subadult female, did hers in just 11 days. So again, our bear really beelined it down there, almost as if she knew where she was going, although she'd never been there. So don't know how that is possible. But I wanted to finish this talk with just two points, and these were mentioned in that tiger paper. And I think it's very important because they also apply to sloth bears. And the first is that the long-term population persistence in fragmented landscapes may depend on individuals transversing through human-dominated landscapes to reach suitable habitats. And this is certainly true in our case where we've been studying the sloth bears. They have to cross human-dominated areas or human-disturbed areas to get to a new area, which of course has a level of risk to it. And then they mention this as well, that small forest patches play a key role in maintaining large carnivore connectivity while dispersing through human dominated landscapes. And again, we found this in our case as well, that our sloth bear was moving from little habitat um, protected areas to other habitat areas while crossing over 
a lot of agricultural areas, roads, that type of thing. So um, the findings from that Tiger paper, I think it was a brilliant paper. And I think we're finding the same thing with our sloth bears in the same, same, like these small habitat patches. Again, they might be so small that they can't support a sloth bear population or anything like that. That doesn't mean they don't have conservation value. They do for potentially smaller species, but actually also for the larger species, if for nothing more than to uh, provide a place where these animals can can stay over while they're um, dispersing across the landscape. So I'll end it there by you. I hope I didn't go too long. Thank you, Thomas. It was wonderful. Uh, when you when you told about the small patch, we just I just thought of our sanctuary. It's a very small sanctuary. We the um, Agra Bear Rescue Facility is situated Sur Sarovar Bird Sanctuary. It's only seven square kilometer, and we have a leopard movement always here. So they just take a place and then move along the river ravine for uh, ravines. So it's very important to small small things to connect, and it is very very information very very informative and um, now i think we should move on to questions than making it late so I will just just uh, read the questions now, which we have here. Okay, uh, do sloth bears uh, do sloth bears are trafficked in India? If yes, then what? I think either of you can answer. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Satyakumar sir will be. Uh, uh, I think uh, Veju. I think uh, you or uh, uh, Thomas can answer this. Oh. <laughs> Do sloth bears are trafficked in India? It is uh, it is very much yes, uh, sir, as mentioned, uh, for gallbladder trades. And um, uh, there are, um, uh, it is going to Southeast Asian countries for bear paw soup, gallbladders, and uh, other body parts. And question number two, what are the buffer solutions for the preservation of DNA collected from the sac uh, SCAD samples? See, yes, when sir. we collect uh, DNA, uh, uh, we want to when you do want to analyze uh, SCAT for genetic analysis, DNA and all, we just store it in one hundred percent ethanol and bring it to the lab. I'm not really clear about this question. What is this preservation? Yeah, hundred percent ethanol is one way to collect the SCAT, or just desiccate it by using um, uh, what do you call uh, silica gel, dry the SCAT, and bring it to the lab. Uh, and uh, one more thing, Yesh Nirmalkar has asked uh, to you only, sir. Your view, mm -hmm. sir, on invasive plants like lantana and other increasing cover in our forest area and their effect on sloth bear and their food habits. Yes, a very good question. Uh, see, our forest may look very good from the top as uh, monitored by the remote sensing analysis of forest cover and all, but the health of the forest is known only by what it's, its undergrowth. Most of our areas are now having a lot of invasive plants like Lantana or Adathoda, Cassiatora, and so many other species in the entire country. When your invasive plants are going to take over your habitats, then the quality goes down and your animals don't no longer get their native favorite food plants. So uh, there is there are programs now to eradicate uh, some of the, or actually I would say control uh, exotics, um, uh, plant species in the country which is being done in some scales, small or large, depending on how much funds are available. But remember, even if you clear lantana in one area, uh, birds can bring the seeds and uh, it can come up again. So it is, it, in, it needs a lot of investment to get in lantana uh, you know, removed totally from an area. Same with the case with many other exotics in most parts of our country. Every, every biotic province in the country has one problem or other with one exotic plant species. So we need to continuously, uh, you know, like use large manpower, even local community parts will remove these uh, exotics or invasives and try and plant native plants 
fruit bearing uh, shrubs so that you can control, you can never completely eradicate, you can only control their uh, distribution densities and extent. Thank you, sir. Another question we have here is: Don't uh, it may can anybody can answer? Don't the uh, don't the bears become stressed by we wearing the collars? Thomas, according to your uh, Thomas, experience, you should you... go with that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Sure. Um, well, there's no question that it's a it's a more invasive type of study for sure, and up to this time we haven't been using them. There's I don't think we can deny that there isn't any stress associated with cholera, and there clearly is. We try to keep that stress to a minimum as much as possible so that the bears can move around naturally and aren't affected by it. But it's something that I do think is important, and obviously we do need to watch the bears and make sure they are comfortable. Okay. Uh, why do the bears have V-shaped mark? on their chest. Does that serve a known purpose? Sir, uh, Satyakumar sir can uh, answer or? Uh, I think we still are wondering what could be the reason for the evolutionary pattern of this V mark in the chest. Maybe one day we'll find out why that is. Yeah, uh, but I, I agree. I've heard one theory that I'll throw out. Uh, I don't know if this is true at all. I'll just throw it out. Is that for example, when when they're facing off with the tiger and they stand up, since they're a black animal, the V kind of shows the size of the bear more. It's something I've heard. I have no idea if there's anything to it or not. Uh, also, I think we are coming up with a study on the V-shaped mark, right, Thomas? Uh, to yes, identify them, them. Yeah. So that uh, that may uh, for uh, if it doesn't serve any purpose for the bears, at least it will uh, serve our um, the scientists at least to understand <laughs> about uh, uh, maybe from the camera trap or something, right? In some Southeast Asian countries, some biology bear biologists have used this methodology of trying to keep three camera traps and uh, hang a bait so that the bear will come and stand up to look for the bait, and then you get a picture of the V mark and. Uh, Identifying individuals based on the V mark is in progress. It's already being tried. And I think yes. we should also try in our country. And I'm happy to know that uh, you are going to try this. Uh, sir, we had already worked on that with our bears, but uh, we are waiting for the publication now. So uh, next, uh, we, uh, next question is, apart from humans, what are sloth bears' worst predators? I'll start. Um... I think their only true natural predator in modern times is the tiger. Um, I know that leopards are often mentioned, and I'd be curious, Dr. Sathya Kumar, your thoughts on that. But I think tigers are the one true predator of the sloth bear. I think leopards are a bit too small, unless it's a small bear or a cub. Okay. Uh, which zone of forest uh, sloth bear prefer generally for most of their activities? Say it one more time, Baiju. Uh, one second. Sorry. Uh, which zone of a forest sloth bear prefer generally for most of their activities? Uh, maybe, I don't know, he would have asked for um, core zone or something like that. He may, I don't know the question. Uh, if I can guess, I think probably is looking at, uh, you know, what kind of uh, forest or what, which part of the forest the bear might like. That's what he's asking. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I, would, I would put it like this, a, a forest which has got a lot of uh, food in the form of fruits and berries and flowers and also a lot of termites and ants, and a good cover, for particularly for dens, denning sites. If they have good denning sites, they will definitely like to use those areas where they can be safe with their cubs and so on. So denning sites may also be influencing the choice of an area within the habitat. Um, uh, 
the next question we have so many questions i don't know we have, whether we have time for this all questions we have enough is it possible to study my biomagnification from bear scat sir mm. i don't know uh... <laughs> So it's a good question we can work on. <laughs> uh, is is uh, zoo cause zoonosis? Zoonosis, I think. Zoo cause uh, zoonosis. Maybe I don't know. It is common in captive bears. How can we reduce it? Zoo causes. I think we should direct this to any of our wildlife veterinarians in wildlife so yeah. to answer. I uh, you that, can answer them easy. by email later. Yeah. Yes. 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 That's that is uh, um, definitely we are going to do that, sir. Uh, how long do sloth bears live in the wild? Twenty twenty two years, sir. Ah, oh, twenty twenty years easily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is the gestation period of sloth bear? And again, courtship period. They are asking. Gestation period. I. Th I think they have a delayed implantation, like most bears. Yes. And once it's yes. planted, then it's two months, uh, roughly, from when the fetus starts growing to when it's born, mm -hmm. which is usually in India in the winter. But uh, in tropic, most of the tropical, subtropical areas, you still think it would be uh, uh, the same pro same process? Because... I think so. Okay, because there's not much of variation in temperature. Uh, you don't have distinct seasons in central and southern India. Yeah, that's northern true. India, yes. I know it is, and maybe you know more about this than I do, but in Sri Lanka, where I've never been yet, I believe that there isn't a certain time of year that they are breeding, whereas it's more distinct in the further north you go. Uh, can one more question is there? Can insertion of chips subcutaneously work better than a call ring? Um, I think uh, it may not be a good idea. Uh, although for uh, cub survival and dispersal, uh, some American bear biologists have used some kind of a, what do you call subcutaneous uh, uh, um, radio collars. I, I won't call it radio collars. Sub subcutaneous transmitters for uh, but. Uh, if you put a chip and all, it's uh, you cannot track the animal if they go very far away. So it really may not work, and it definitely is an invasive way of trying to study an animal. Okay. Yeah, we don't know the healing and what will happen after that. Yeah. Um, how do you provide current enrichment and stimulation for bears in the sanctuary? That we can answer. Don't worry. What is the survival rate of bear babies in the wild and captivity? Activity badge, you can go ahead. Uh, no, we we don't we have not breeding the bear, so I cannot tell <laughs> exactly uh, survival rate for the um, uh, Thomas. Can you have we done anything on the in the wild? But they are asking in captivity because we don't our bears are not um, like we are we don't breed bears here, so I have not um, come across like that. But uh, mostly the sloth bears care very well, so. Uh, yeah, we, we've been trying to look at that. I don't have any numbers to give yet, um, but we do have even bears which have raised three cubs at once, all to the point where they dispersed from the mother. Um, and of course, in our area, which is um, more fragmented and there are more anthropogenic risks, my guess would be in our area, fewer cubs make it to adulthood than in a more protected area, simply because there's so many pitfalls in these areas. But yeah. Can uh, somebody has asked, can Asiatic lions and sloth bear sh share same habitat in India? Historically, exactly. they must have shared. Definitely. With exactly. tigers and lions. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Very and good. you know, it's, that's really interesting question because I've actually been looking at that and they must have overlapped at one point. But in there are no bears, obviously, in, in Gurgi National Park. Um, yeah, but in North Gujarat, we have a little bit of North Gujarat, we have bears. But yes. in the historical past, definitely they would have overlapped with both tigers and lions. Yeah, agree. Wow, very, very good information. What is the average distance a sloth bear can travel in a night? 
So we have a very lot of diverse study in that now, 12 kilometers to 125 kilometers. They can move quite well. Um, yeah. I mean, this one that dispersed was moving, I mean, over 10 kilometers a night easy. Oh, wow. So, I mean, they can move. I, I've never seen that before, but if they want to, they can move pretty fast. Cool. I think, so, uh, I... yeah, uh, you missed one question from Susan Rubin. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Are sloth bears more dangerous to people versus the three other species? Uh, yes, the more one of the most highly unpredictable animals in Indian forest would be sloth bear. Yeah, I think they're actually probably responsible for more attacks on humans than potentially all other seven species combined. It's they're that dangerous. That's yes. Uh, why don't we think like that? Because it is mostly distributed species. Because uh, if if you look at other species, it is only in some patches, right? No, no. If you look at the other bears in the of the world, some of them have very well, dis well, very widely distributed also. But okay. sloth bear is really unpredictable. It can get agitated very fast, and attacks are very common. Okay, okay. okay. It doesn't give a chance to the human nearby, right? So, yeah. When once we had also done a study on uh, Himalayan black bear, sir, um, in Kashmir, uh, Srinagar. So yeah. there also we had interviewed many people, me and colleague. So their uh, their attack is also very very dangerous they just swipe it no yeah but if you look at the uh what do you call the number of uh people uh, per cap per square kilometer unit area in the uh, bear habitats of uh sloth bear areas and black bear areas and if you ask questions like how many times they saw a bear and they it was there was nothing no no encounter right they yes. just saw and they, they both run in run away in different directions correct yeah and it is interesting, Baiju, you mentioned our Asiatic black bear attack study, but Kashmir is, it's a kind of an, an anomaly for that species. Yes. You go up to places, there are Asiatic black bear attacks, but nowhere near the number that are occurring in that area. Yes. It's interesting. Uh, have there been rehabilitation and release of orphaned cubs successfully? I think you I think, should uh, have that question. I think that was, there were some studies done by, I think, uh, Wildlife Trust of India. Yes, on, yeah, uh, I think so. Release sir. of orphan yeah. cubs with collars, yes. Yeah. In Northeast India, yeah. Uh, range of distance up to which uh, bear can see, is it also affected by weather like in other animals? Uh, I think sloth bears, uh, uh, no, they can't see much. Their their vision is not as sharp as other animals uh, because of their shaggy uh, coat also could be one reason. So that could be one reason that uh, people go very close or uh, the animal doesn't see a human until it, uh, he or she is very close. I don't think they can see very far. Oh, that's correct. Uh, any memorable experience related to cognitive or emotional intelligence of sloth bear that left you in awe of them? Sir, it I don't have any. I don't have any experiences like that. Maybe Thomas. May have, I do. So. I don't either. But by you, you might. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have many experiences with sloth bear here in our centers. That is definitely they are very intelligent animals. Because uh, uh, one uh, one study we we had done. Um, um, I myself had done one study for the blind bears, and uh, we just uh, dug one pit and uh, what you call. Um, um, hid uh, uh, treats inside or to to avoid from monkeys. So they're very intelligent. So they can just slowly go and sniff and dig it out. So there are many incidents like this. They are very, very intelligent, anim intelligent animal. Uh, and uh, there are some incidents we had uh, like um, taking out honeycomb by a, a sloth bear, which is uh, rehabilitated here. He just hide his face. He just beat the honeycomb. Once it is broken, he just hide his face to avoid from bee sting. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's how they do all these things. So they are very intelligent, quite intelligent in that case. 
And next question is, as mentioned in the webinar, slot bears have huge movement home ranges. So is it possible in coming years, they can overlap with the lion habitat due to fragmentation and anthropogenic pressure? Sir, you can answer. Lion is also expanding its range. Who knows, in the near future, we could have a bear, slot bear and lions uh, ranging overlap also. It's quite possible. We really don't know. Can happen. Yes, sir. It is. It's it very is very, 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 very uh, possible. Very possible thing because yeah, the growing see, in Gujarat, Yes. Yeah. Sorry. In Gujarat, if you see slot bear current distribution and lion distribution, lion distribution is definitely has expanded in the recent years, right? So the yes. distance between sloth bear in Gujarat and the lion in Gujarat is not very high. Oh wow. And uh, like growing uh, habitat fragmentation and all these things, animals can move anywhere, wherever they get small patches of forest. So we don't know what will happen tomorrow. Yes. There sloth are now... Bears may not, sloth bears may not move, but lions will move. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, that's why I would put it this way. Uh, <laughs> okay. There are now three ember that stick to fur on polar bears to monitor their movement. At uh, That might work on sloth bears too. Uh, I don't know whether this is question so this, or this is giving us... No, no, it's a comment. It's a comment. Yeah, three embers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Three embers. Uh, I'm not aware of this. Maybe, Thomas, you are aware of this? Three embers? I'm I'm not. Um, yeah, okay. Okay. A stick to a fur on... Three uh, M is uh, that sticker. We get it, no? That, uh, what do you call, very, very quiet a sticker. That that is the same thing I'm thinking. It's sticking to maybe for some monitoring some moments. There are maybe many. Maybe could ask uh, uh, Mark God, uh, Goodman to uh, uh, yeah, tell we us. Yeah, we will send him. Google, we'll it, send Google it, it up later. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Despite of their big size, they eat ants and termites. Why? Because sloth bears have evol uh, evolved to feed only on ants and mites. See, although they are carnivore, they feed mostly on fruits, flowers, and other. But their protein intake is very limited. Black bears and brown bears do uh, scavenge some dead uh, mammals or even kill occasionally livestock and, uh, you know, uh, animals, wild animals, which are uh, diseased and things like that. But sloth bears have to get their protein only by, uh, you know, feeding on insects. And their uh, snout is their uh, canines. They don't have upper incisors or they're not well formed. So they can suck. Uh, termites and ants easily. So they get protein only from insects. So you evolved to feed only on ants. Very nice. What measures can be taken to address the conflict between humans and sloth bears, particularly in the context of crop raiding and what implication does climate change have on sloth bear reproduction? Sir, it is up to you. Uh, uh, sir, it is to you. Yeah, there are many measures that governments and both central and state governments are taking to reduce conflicts with bears. Uh, one is the awareness creation, uh, uh, lighting up of the village areas so that there's enough light in the night, uh, using alarms, uh, repellents, deterrents, also uh, making sure that people don't go into the bear habitat. So even construction of toilets in all the villages and encouraging people to use them uh, these all have, have been taking, uh, going on, I would say. Um, power fences really don't work easily uh, because they can dig and can move also. That is one reason. And uh, impacts of climate change on sloth bear reproduction, I think it's uh, not known as of now. But climate change impacts the bear habitats per se. So we really don't know. We, somebody has to investigate this in future. And there is an interesting question because of YouTubes and other things. How often do tiger sloth bear conflict happen? Because of many videos and photos, people are asking that question. Oh, well, I see a message from Mark Goodman. He says, contact Polar Bears International for that 3M. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That, that we will definitely. In terms of the sloth, tiger, tiger sloth... sloth. Pardon? Yeah. Sorry, please go ahead. I was just going to say, we brought up earlier that the sloth bears probably live 20 years or more in the wild. And although I don't think those interactions take place daily, 
I think a soft bear who overlaps with tigers, and I'd be curious, Dr. Sathya Kumar, your views on this, I think they would run into tigers multiple times a year. And so over the lifetime of a bear, that's a lot of interactions. Oh, Mark Goodman says that they couldn't use collars on polar bears. So they developed a burr that sticks to the fur. Yeah, yeah good. That's that's very interesting. Uh, we should also look into that uh, because there are many development coming. Like recently I had um, seen uh, for the cattle in Kerala, somebody had developed to track them, just hang around the neck so they can track the movements and all this. So many things in coming AI and... Uh, uh, what do you call uh, this uh, most modern modern techniques may bring more more changes the smaller things so with this i think we can uh, wind up our session hope everybody enjoyed and thank you so much for uh, your time sir uh, and thomas your two any message for everybody to protect the species Oh, and I told you the happy beginning world, only, yes. Again, again, happy World uh, Sloth Bear Day once again to all. And uh, we all uh, will try to protect this species every 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 day of uh, the year now is to protect one species, to give importance to every species. So let us all make some change uh, to conserve the wildlife and protect our species. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this uh, session. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, Beju, and thanks, Thomas, for joining. Thanks. Thank you, sir. It was a nice interaction. Thanks.